Вітаю всіх учасників конференції. Мене звати Оксана Глєбашкіна. Мені 42 роки. Я народилась в сонячному місті Херсон на півдні України і прожила все своє життя там. Це відео я вам записую з не менш чудового міста на заході України, міста Івано-Франківськ, куди я і моя родина вимушені були переїхати після двох місяців окупації в Херсоні. В Івано-Франківську ми відкрили Херсонський хаб, і саме в ньому я записую це відео. Чому ми виїхали з Херсону? Тому що після повномасштабного вторгнення, коли Херсон був окупований, окупанти, Нацгвардія, військові почали полювати на активних людей, щоб залякати, зупинити, закрити в підвал і спробувати зупинити той громадський опір і рух супротиву, який побачила вся Україна, який побачив весь світ, оскільки ми виходили на мітинг і бороли за свою свободу, бороли за свою землю. Сьогодні Херсон вже звільнений і ніби можна було б повернутися в Херсон, але війна продовжується і в Херсоні щодня люди страждають від щоденних обстрілів. Поки ми в Івано-Франківську намагаємося побудувати своє життя побутове, професійне, прив'язуючись до графіків виключення світла через блекаут, через пошкодження інфраструктури. Ми залежимо напряму від кількості атак, які здійснюються з неба, і ми маємо по декілька тривог на день, і саме зараз теж лунає тривога, і це означає, що є небезпека для всієї України. Але в Івано-Франківську ми можемо більш-менш жити з звичайним життям. Звичайно, важко сказати, де в Україні зараз може бути нормальне життя. Але в Херсоні люди не знають, коли саме почнеться обстріл. В Херсоні люди тривожаться, якщо немає обстрілів, бо це означає, що скоро він почнеться. За останню добу було пошкоджено три навчальних заклади, був обстріляний історичний центр міста. Щодня кожен із херсонців, хто залишається в Херсоні, допомагає іншим, ризикує потрапити під обстріл та стати жертвою. Одна з наших волонтерок, яку ми підтримували в грудні, загинула під час обстрілів. Саме тому я звертаюся до вас і прошу вашої підтримки, оскільки Україна бореться зараз за цінності свободи, за цінності демократії і є щитом для Європи. Тому дуже просимо ваш уряд і вас підтримувати нас в нашій боротьбі, надавати нам зброю, переконувати уряд, якщо зволікають з рішеннями, бо кожен день війни забирає життя. Дякую. Das war Oksana Hlebushkina. Eine von fünf Millionen We just listened to Oksana Hlebushkina, one of five million people affected from the events in Ukraine. As you've listened to her, she's from Kherson and she fled to ivano where she uh, feels a little safe at least. Welcome to the 23rd Foreign Policy Conference of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. My name is Giorgio Franceschini and this is our second session of this year's conference and we still have as an issue the security situation in Eastern Europe and yesterday we talked uh, to experts from the region, from Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia and Armenia, and we would like to extend our circle of experts today, and we'll still talk about security in Eastern Europe, and uh, now we'll discuss with transatlantic experts um, who will be with us here on the session. And we would like to involve you in the debate, and therefore we would like to ask you to use uh, our questions and answers tool that you find in the Zoom interface and ask your questions uh, that we will later try to answer together with our guests. Should you not be up to asking your questions, then we may have a question for you and uh, I've planned one or two surveys and polls for you. Yesterday we started out the session quite alike with a statement of a cultural activist uh, from Mikolaev. Uh, and then afterwards I was talking to a teacher from Georgia about the situation on the ground. 
in Georgia. And this is a, a kind of a pattern that we use in those foreign policy conferences. Before we start off with the discussion, we would like to talk uh, to those people who are most affected. We call it a message from the ground. And this is why we are really pleased to receive the video message from Oksana Lebushkina. And uh, we have one more message from the ground uh, that uh, is up next. And I'm happy to be connected to Maya Mazjakiewicz, whom I would like to ask uh, to intervene now. If she could uh, briefly switch on your camera, no, keep her camera switched on, and then we keep on talking in English. Maya, thank you for joining us. You are um, with. You are joining us from Warsaw. Uh, you are the co-founder and head of strategic communication of Alliance for Europe. And your organization and yourself, you are very heavily involved in dealing with the uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis. Uh, we heard today again uh, the, the terrible numbers that we have about 5 million internally displaced people in Ukraine, and uh, Oksana Klebushkina was one of them. Uh, and we have 8 million people who fled Ukraine, many going through Poland. You are dealing somehow with both of them. Maybe you can share with us a little bit what the, you see as your biggest challenge at the moment in dealing with Ukrainian refugees, both in Ukraine itself and uh, when they leave Ukraine and come to Poland and the rest of Europe. Maya. Thank you very much, Giorgio. Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, indeed, uh, we as Alliance for Europe and me, we are um, active with the refugee crisis from the very, uh, very beginning uh, of the invasion um, of Russia to Ukraine uh, from basically day one. Um, as all the polls, because I think what we've seen uh, at the very beginning was a beautiful uh, rise of hearts. Uh, to support uh, the crisis uh, and the refugees here in Poland uh, when they were uh, fleeing homes uh, from the war and uh, and things that we haven't seen um, before. I mean, we need to say that uh, what happened in Poland uh, for the first few months, uh, it was uh, extraordinary. And a situation like this never happened. Uh, Poland uh, from immigration country became the immigration country. So we had 10% uh, of uh, foreigners in basically a few, few months, few months time. Um, at the beginning, it was uh, all the time rapid response, and we've been active to, to basically save lives and su to support uh, the housing uh, and the very, uh, very first hand experience uh, to make sure that Ukrainians uh, can feel safe in Poland or um, be, be farther, go farther to fight, flight, uh, to fly to other places and find their homes. Uh, right now, the situation, at least in Poland, because not really in Ukraine, um, has calmed down. But uh, the situation is uh, that we don't really know what happens. We have uh, a lot of INGOs, so UNHSR and different agencies uh, coming to Poland um, with the support. However, the response needs to be different, and uh, and that's something that also organizations as INGOs needed to learn to work on the ground with the local um, civil society organizations uh, and regional governments, because uh, people and those organizations were on the first um, line of the crisis and still are. Right now, what we are trying to do uh, is to coordinate the support and work together uh, towards uh, giving the best uh, way of supporting uh, the refugees and migrants. Uh, we believe that it's uh, not only giving the, the financial support, but it's also about making sure that those people can stand on their own legs and give them the support on the more complex and holistic way. And that's what we are doing in Poland. Uh, in Rzeszów, we are right now starting the partnership hub where we are doing the subgranting for different organizations to make sure that there is not uh, fragmentation of work, but rather that we are working together and bringing the very holistic approach where we are having the support for the uh, refugees in terms of the job activization, psychological support, and, um, and the integration, because integration part is very, very important 
important. A lot of Ukrainians are just sitting in their own um, communities, and it's important that they also start to mingle uh, with Poles. And another thing that is super crucial is also disinformation that is flowing from Russia and is being weaponized already in Ukraine that is very visible, but also in Poland and other uh, European countries. Uh, so we're also doing the research on seeing how the uh, how the disinformation is changing the attitudes of people. We're already seeing various narratives um, that uh, might be an issue and that we believe that we need to bring more on the strategic and positive communication uh, to, to remember those positive feelings as well thank you maya last week uh, we had a we had a short conversation and then i told you that in this call we will have among other people member of the european parliament we will have senior american experts and i just i asked you i said if you have you you know some form some some expectations on the eu or even on our american friends uh, with respect to what you're doing what would that be um, I would very much like to see more strategizing decisions and uh, coordination. I've been working for the Polish president back in 2014 uh, when I was involved uh, in the first invasion of uh, Russia to Ukraine. We've been bringing the situation back then, saying that it might uh go stronger uh the same thing we've seen already back in 2007 2009 where the southern european countries were saying about the refugee flow uh already back then i think that we need to more listen to each other and see what happens strategize and really come together we need a big fund for the uh for the support the refugees and uh, really coordinate and support those that are on the ground because really the civil society is making a job and it's great to see the coordination and uh, cooperation of the civil society people european union and transatlantic resources we also believe that would be great to have a more of the um, workshop approach to really bring experts that are working with migration and refugee response in different places in different countries in the world and come together to uh, do a blueprint that we can further use because the situation in Poland is extraordinary right now. But uh, from all the research um, that we're seeing, also with the climate change, migration and refugee crisis will only strengthen. Maya Mazurkiewicz, a message from the ground from Warsaw. Thank you very much for being with us. Sure. And before we start now our first discussion, I have a very short poll which I would like to do in German. So I change language. Und äh, ich würde gern mit Ihnen, dem Publikum, äh, mit dieser Umfrage starten. I would like to start out with this poll with you. And I will ask a question quite simply. Do Germany and the USA have a common strategy when they support Ukraine? So we've put it a bit more detailed. Do the Biden-Harris administration and the federal government of Germany have a common strategy to support Ukraine? You might have noticed that um, in uh, the last question, when it came to delivering the battle tanks, the leopard battle tanks, and um, that there were some tensions and friction between Germany and the USA, but in the end, they found some common ground. So I would like to ask you if uh, the USA and Germany join forces, and that's what we like to know from you. And whenever you have cast your vote, I'd like to see uh, the outcome. And the result is... And the result is very clear. It says that about one third of uh, our participants say that Germany and the United States have a common strategy when it comes to supporting the Ukraine. And a bit less than two thirds of uh, our participants say that they do not see such a joint or common strategy. This is something we'd like to discuss in more detail. And here I'm very happy to include Eva van der Bach, my colleague from Brussels, and she is the head of our EU office in Brussels. Eva, it's nice to have you here. I, I'm not sure which channel are you on. <laughs> I just hand over to you and you're going to talk to English guests and probably or maybe you would like to start your presentation in English. You have the floor. 
Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Giorgio, and good afternoon, everyone from Brussels. It is my honor to moderate the next hour of our today's session, and we will start with a round analyzing U.S. and German policies to support Ukraine and ways to improve transatlantic cooperation. Let me please introduce the next two speakers to you, and please note that you will find more detailed information about our experts in the chat. I would like to welcome Catherine Stoner, Professor of Political Science at Stanford University, and Stefan Meister, Head of the Center for Order and Governance in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia at the German Council on Foreign Relations. A warm welcome to both of you, Catherine and Stefan. In their conversation, Catherine and Stefan will have a close look at the goals and strategies of the Biden-Harris administration and the federal government of Germany as response to Russia's ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine. Please note that during this part of our debate, a stopwatch will be running to indicate our speakers the time for their respective intervention. Well, my first question goes to Catherine. Catherine, what are US policies and perspectives and how do you assess them? The floor is yours. Great, thank you very much for having me. And I'll, I'll try to be careful with my three minutes. I'll start my own stopwatch here as well. Um, so uh, first of all, we, I think one of, one of our uh, goals and strategies is overall here in the United States to, to announce that we're back uh, working with you as partners uh, rather than as uh, adversaries or, or frenemies. Uh, and this is a shift from the Trump administration. So um, the, 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 the big reason that we care so much um, about Ukraine, however, is that this isn't the first time Russia has invaded Ukraine, as was mentioned earlier. This is a follow-up to 2014, but it's also invaded Georgia and Moldova. It's violated international law in invading Ukraine um, and grabbing territory. Um, 2014, of course, was the first time with the illegal annexation of uh, the Crimean Peninsula in response to millions of Ukrainians protesting for a democratic and European future. Uh, ousting a corrupt president, uh, Yanukovych, uh, who looks very similar, looked very similar to the kind of regime that Vladimir Putin runs in Russia. Um, Russia, in return, orchestrated and supported an ongoing war in Ukraine for eight years in the East. It supplied it, financed it, and trained it. In that eight-year period, 14,000 Ukrainians died um, before the invasion even started almost exactly a year ago. If we don't stop Russian aggression in Ukraine, it will continue possibly threatening other mem members of the European Union, including Poland, as we just heard, and the peace that we have enjoyed in most of Europe since the end of World War II. So it is a fundamental uh, security concern to the United States as it is to our European partners. We also see repeatedly Russian malign influence in other parts of the world, electoral interference in the United States presidential elections in 2016, and in some of your elections in Europe and Germany for the Bundestag as well, financing of far-right parties in France and elsewhere. Even though on paper, Russia under Vladimir Putin doesn't have the most of anything, that is money, arms, or people, it is a globally disruptive power, and Ukraine is, uh, is a symbol of that, of course. This was a war of choice for Putin, not a war of necessity. He has spun a false narrative that Ukraine posed a threat to Russian security. It is, of course, just the possibility of a free Ukraine as an example for his own people that is a threat not to Russia, but to Putin's corrupt authoritarianism. So what, is the US, what are the US goals? First and foremost, the overarching goal is Ukrainian success and surviving as a nation state that is prosperous, sovereign, and democratic. Um, to defend the US charter, um, to uh, weaken Russia, I think, is now an implicit strategic goal, not to lead Ukraine or Ukrainians to tell them what to do, um, but to take back at least the territory that was taken from them since February of last year, to stop the conflict from spreading beyond Ukraine, um, and to support the Ukrainian population with humanitarian assistance. What have we done? Well, we've given $50 billion in aid. Um, we uh, have, with our European partners, coordinated on targeting Russia's financial system. The Russian economy is now in deep deficit um, and uh, inflation is at almost 12%. Uh, its GDP is in negative growth, budget deficits 
uh, in, uh, in the Russian Federation are common where just a few years ago they had had surpluses. This process will worsen over time, but it'll take more time and more patience. We, uh, of course, keep ramping up our military assistance uh, as we see the in increased and remarkable uh, competence of Ukrainian fighters and their will to defend themselves. Um, what have we done wrong? I'll just end with this. Um, we underestimated Ukrainians' ability and will to fight. We have self-deterred at times in the face of Russian nuclear threats. We've been too slow in giving Ukraine what it needs to defend itself. Um, we have set an oil price cap, which is a major accomplishment, but the price is too high. Um, some sanctions, of course, are leaky. And I'll stop there. Uh, I have lots to say about problems uh, in the future. Yes, thank you so much, Catherine. And indeed, there will be another round where you can also um, comment on what should actually improve. Um, Stefan, what are German policies and perspectives and how do you assess them, keeping, of course, in mind that Germany always acts as a member of the European Union? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for inviting me for, for this event. I think um, the first point for me is that this war marks the end of the post Cold War Europe security order. Um, and there is a growing understanding that there is no security out, outside of NATO any, anymore in Europe. And who is not part of NATO is not secure. It can always be attacked uh, by the Russian side. I think for the first time, German leadership recognizes that the Russian aggression is also about our security. Um, and we have to invest in our German, European, and NATO defense capabilities. And I think that's different to the Russian aggression in 2014 with the um, with the annexation of Crimea and um, and the war on Donbass, where where which still looks away. Um, I think this is a fundamental shift in how we as Germany understand security and how to deal with Russia. And uh, we we have we talked a lot of about this 100 billion euro and two percent um, for the German uh, uh, defense budget, but I think there is also a increasing understanding that this will not be enough. This can be only a starting point uh, to get to to the level um, uh, of modernization that we we can compete somehow um, and we adapt to the to the new reality. But I think there will come more investment and and more needs. Um, I think we need to improve pro pro processes for procurement um, and investment and upgrading our defense industry. So I think it's a lot of about internal um, questions also in Germany on security. Um, Germany has started to decouple from Russian oil and gas um, and will change um, uh, and uh, will change the nature of the, the German Russian and EU Russian relations. Um, Russia has become a major security risk um, for European security and is setting a dangerous precedent uh, globally. And I think that's a fundamental different understanding of Russia in Europe. And, um, and I think all this will really change the nature also of the German-Russian relations, which have been at the core um, in, in Europe uh, yeah, in dealing with Russia, but also the EU-Russia relations. Uh, the EU and with the EU, Germany agreed on the most comprehensive sanction package for such a big country uh, um, like Russia since World War II. I think that's a that's that's something really huge for the for the EU and also for Germany. Um, but we also have to understand. We also learned again that the US is key for for Germany's security, and the Chancellor Scholz is coordinating and coupling every decision for weapon supply with US leadership. Germany is not leading Europe on this war, but it's the US, and that is and, and I think that is wanted by the German Chancellor who wants to share the risks also with, with the partner countries. Germany and Europe are not sovereign in terms of their own security. Um, I think what, what we also see is that Germany will do everything that Ukraine does not lose the war, according to Chancellor War, but does it do enough that Ukraine wins the war? And I think that leads, leads uh, maybe to the next discussion we also have. Um, there is a support now for EU integration of Ukraine by the German leadership with the candidate status, but I think there is a lack also of a middle-term and long-term strategy for, for Russia and for Ukraine, and I would stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. In the next three minute slots, you will have time to respond to each other, also exploring the question where German and US policies could and should improve. Um, Catherine, you already started with that, but please, um, um, the floor is yours again. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. I, um, well, 
although we're supposed to be debating, I fear we're going to primarily agree, but um, um, I, I think the coordination is, is a remarkable thing, obviously, um, uh, among the EU and, and between the EU, the United States, and I should add, I'm a dual US Canadian citizen, so I can speak for the Northern part of NATO, I suppose, here in North America as well. Um, that uh, that is obviously something completely unexpected by Vladimir Putin, um, and the, that that I think is one of the primary goals going forward is making sure that we continue that coordination um, and march in lockstep. And and so the the coordination on tanks, for example, in the last week week and a half or so, uh, is is a, a good example of that. It was obviously a difficult uh, discussion to have uh, among friends, but it's one that I think was the the outcome was right um, for for Ukraine in particular. Um, I think are we doing enough is, is a, a very good question and can we continue to do at least what we've started here? Um, Putin is counting on the fact that we cannot uh, continue to do it. Um, and um, so there have been some things that we have done wrong, as I mentioned, um, and um, some things that I think are problematic from the US uh, perspective in future. First of all, if we lose congressional support here in the United States under a Republican um, House of Representatives, as we now have, uh, this will be highly problematic. Now, as long as uh, President Biden um, or another president who is uh, understands the gravity of this situation, not just for European security and Ukrainian security, but also for American security, then, then we'll be fine. But a big tragedy here would be if we do have the re-election of Donald Trump or someone like Trump, uh, who, as though there is someone like Trump, and let me just apologize on behalf of North America for Donald Trump, um, that, that he became the U.S. president. But um, if he were to be re-elected, which is not a zero probability, unfortunately, this is someone who has a, a long, difficult history with Ukraine and um, may may and and appears to be very fond of Vladimir Putin. And there are, of course, leaders within the European Union like Viktor Orban who can be flies in the ointment of of your unity. Um, so this is something to watch for going going forward. The other thing, of course, is that we all have our own problems and uh, the U.S. That, that there could be the danger of the U.S. public losing attention and, and patience with this. Um, Another issue is should the Ukrainians lose momentum this spring, um, then uh, how long are we you know, able to keep focus uh, on this? And Putin is counting on our unity um, disrupting um, and we just simply cannot let that happen. So as Stefan said, we have the most remarkable uh, and wide ranging uh, sanctions on an economy of this size never before in history. Um, and it is absolutely crucial that we continue to uh, make sure that sanctions regime is, is not leaky with China, Turkey, or anywhere else. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And also, Stefan, you have now the time to uh, respond to um, Catherine's uh, inputs. And uh, please um, also have a look at where German and US policies could and should improve from your perspective. I think uh, on one hand, there is a remarkable coordination, but I think there is also a need to grow up uh, for the European Union and also for Germany. And um, I think there will be a demand from, um, from the US side, an increasing demand um, to, um, to, 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 to do more, to pay more, to, to share more burden also. Um, this is about our neighborhood. Yeah, it's, it's not a direct neighborhood of, of the US. For the US, it's, I think, a lot of also about China. Uh, and, and signaling also to China um, what can happen, yeah, so if, if they do maybe something, something similar in, in their in environment. And I think uh, without the US, uh, there would be no Ukraine, yeah, and uh, I think uh, anymore. I think we have also to have this in mind uh, that um, uh, Germany and the EU did a lot of, um, uh, and they were really growing also into, into this, this, this conflict uh, with their response, but without US action um, and also US support, especially in the first month, um, uh, it, it, we wouldn't not be where we are now. And I think there would be much more success also from, uh, from, the, from the Russian side. So I think just also to add this, um, there's this lack of German leadership is weakening the EU, in my opinion. 
um, uh, yeah, there, there is no other big member state who can play this role on, on Eastern issues. And, and even if France is trying to fill this gap, I, I don't think this is, this is possible. I think we have also, as Germany, learned the mistakes from, from, from the Ostpolitik. I think we need also a review of, um, of what went wrong and build on these, um, on these assessments uh, a new policy towards Eastern Europe and Russia. And we have to shift from a, from a, a Russia first policy, uh, at least for the next uh, years, to a Ukraine first policy, um, which will be crucial for, for the EU in, in many ways. And we have to plan for a longer term also funding of, the Ukraine, of Ukraine, of supporting Ukraine. Um, uh, and, and I think that needs to be explained to the societies. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think also what Catherine has saying, um, there will be less support uh, if the costs are growing, um, if we are keeping the sanctions, um, I think uh, the support will 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 decline. Yeah, and I think that's exactly the, the time on which uh, Russian leadership is also playing. They think that our societies are weaker than um, than, than their society, uh, which they control with uh, with their authoritarian uh, policy, and that on one point the support for this war will will decline. And I think here. We have to do our homework, but we have to coordinate each other also, um, and uh, and we have to we have to build up uh, a more strategic policy. We have to really do a, a mental Zeitenwende and a strategic Zeitenwende, which, in my opinion, has not taken place until now. I think there's a lot of wording, but there is still a lot of the same uh, we have seen before, and also some hopes that we can keep uh, somehow the comfort zone. And I think. That's a different reality in which we are now. And I think we have still haven't enough catched up with this. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Um, coming back to the poll question, um, I would like you to I would like to ask you to share your take on where we actually stand with regard to a common strategy. And what are your recommendations to strengthen transatlantic cooperation and coordination? You already mentioned a few um, few issues, but I would like to um, ask you to go into more detail. And there is one question um, for Catherine. I would like to read this question to you. Dear Mrs. Stoner, how do you assess the RAND Corporation's latest report on Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine? So Catherine, would uh, you like to start? So, sure. So uh, which aspects of the RAND Corporation report? Because there are lots of uh, different ones. But Well, it was not uh, specified. I think you can just comment on the aspects you would like to comment okay. on. OK. OK. So um, you know, I think, uh, and, and I'll also respond more directly to the what what can what more can we do? What more sh uh, should we do? Um, well, I, I think there's lots of things that we can do together, whether whether we follow specifically what what Rand recommends or not. And they're just a think tank. It basically it based at UCLA, and they're perfectly fine. But they have no particular insight. I think that that uh, that others um, others don't have, especially uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace and um, um, Atlantic Council and elsewhere. So, you know, I think one thing we want to do is is we have to work together to deter this from happening anywhere else, right? So uh, Stefan finished there with, with the Mr. Putin's regime counting on the exhaustion of our own populations if this were to drag on. Um, and he will just throw people uh, at this war, uh, which is what evidently they're going to do this spring. So um, we, we have to make sure that we maintain you know, support among our, our own um, populations maintain um, deterrence um, from Russia for this ever happening again. And, and so I think one recommendation um, that I've seen from um, the head of NATO, that, it, that I've seen also from the US Institute of Peace and some former US policymakers uh, on Ukraine is, uh, is to in effect build uh, Ukraine up on the US-Israeli model. And that is provide sufficient quality and quantity of military and financial aid to ensure that Ukraine is, is able to build and maintain a military force in future um, that can deter or defeat any future uh, Russian invasion. Um, we have to bring Ukraine into unilateral, uh, pardon me, multilateral institutions. Um, the EU membership is probably a stretch, as Stefan said, but, um, but at least um, um, we can see the effects on internal Ukrainian politics right now going after uh, 
corruption that has long plagued Ukraine. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is to maintain the NATO affiliation and to maintain the flow of arms in, into Ukraine. And so they'll get better governance as well. I think we also finally have to be careful not to fall into the pattern of encouraging or forcing a ceasefire um, because we'll just create another frozen conflict and Russia will be back uh, and they will retain the ability to thaw that conflict uh, once they have uh, regrouped uh, and rested um, as, as we've seen here in Ukraine already since 2014. And then finally, I think we have to stop being self-deterred by uh, Mr. Putin's nuclear threats. Um, and um, uh, that, that is, uh, I think, something we're learning over time. I'll stop there. And sorry, the question um, about the report, could you comment on that? There is so, a specification I, um, by the participant posing the question saying, the report was quoted to argue that Crimea cannot be freed and more or less East Ukraine neither, and that there should be a deal soon. Yeah, so I, right. So I would disagree with that. Um, I know who, who wrote that. I was trying to, to uh, avoid sort of direct criticism of a, of a, um, of a colleague, but I think that's ridiculous. Um, so uh, Crimea could be freed. I think if the Ukrainians can do that, and, they, and, and certainly they're, I think, soon to be former defense minister, maybe as of, as of this morning, California time, former defense minister had said that that's a possibility. That is, that is absolutely uh, Ukrainian territory and, and sovereignty and, uh, it should be protected there. So if they are able to free it, they should free it. I think that's a big ask, however. But at the very least, at the very least, it would be absolutely naive to allow the Russian military to have any presence and the Russian government any presence whatsoever in the four provinces that it has claimed as part of Russia. I, I mean, this is a complete violation of the UN Charter. It is a complete violation of international law. And watch out, Moldova. Watch out, Poland. They're coming for you next. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is this is just folly. This is a short-term solution uh, to uh, a, a problem, and it will come back and bite us uh, and bite Ukrainians and, frankly, Europeans in, in a few more years. Um, so that would be an absolutely unacceptable uh, policy to follow, and you watch that will be completely disregarded in, in uh, Washington. Um, unless, unless, of course, uh, our population becomes uh, exhausted, our economy is in the tank, and none of that is happening, actually. We just had a huge job, positive jobs report yesterday here in the United States. Inflation is falling, people can find jobs. Um, whether they perceive that or, or understand that, uh, feel it on the ground is another question. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's also zero reason right now, given how well the Ukrainians are doing, to make any such deal uh, in uh, with Vladimir Putin. And, and I think also, you know, another really important thing here is that the Russians have consistently lied through, <laughs> throughout this conflict. They amassed over 100,000 troops on their border. Uh, we can see them clearly in our satellites. And they're saying they didn't. And it's just an exercise. Why would we believe, after all of this experience since 2014, a word that they say um, with respect to, um, we'll just stay over here in this corner of Ukraine and build it as Russians? Um, of course they won't. Of course they'll be back. Um, and our current policymakers have the good sense, of course, to know that that's the case. So couldn't agree, disagree more strongly. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, this very clear answer. And Stefan, the last three minutes of this round um, belong to you. So, so um, where do we stand? What are your recommendations for um, strengthening transatlantic cooperation? And if you would also like to comment on the report, please go ahead. So I think um, for me, the main problem is that we are still too much in a crisis management modus and not really in a, in a, in a strategizing uh, modus. And um, uh, yes, the US is, is in the driver's seat for, for European security um, at the moment. Um, uh, the Europeans more or less following, but I think it's still Russia who has the escalation dominance. And I think also referring to this report, um, if if they would stay on the territory of Ukraine and they would be able to regroup and uh, to recover also their military capabilities 
they will attack again Ukraine. I think that's the that's the problem what we what we face. And they might not only attack Ukraine. We we just recently had the, the statements from Mr. Lavrov um, uh, on Moldova. Um, yeah, so I think there are also other countries who could be a target of, of of an aggression. So I think that's unfortunately the case. It's not that we like it. Yeah, that um, that. Uh, there is this confrontation, but I think it's Russia who has attacked Ukraine, and it's still on the territory of Ukraine. And I think this is this is unacceptable. Yeah. So, and I think that that needs to be to have in mind. Um, so, um, I think uh, only the Russian aggression has created unity in Europe um, and has brought the US back to Europe. I think we also have to say this is a reaction to the Russian aggression. Um, but I think this return um, uh, will not last for long, and Europeans have to become more autonome also in terms of their security and, and neighborhood policy. So I'm I'm supporting here this transatlantic approach, but I still would like to argue that the US will not stay forever in Europe and spend a lot of money um, and troops and so on in uh, on European security. I think we will have to pay more. We will have to take more responsibility and the focus of the US, no, no matter who is president, if it's, if it's Biden, or if it's Trump, um, uh, I think there will be a shift away, in a way, from uh, from, from, from Europe, um, and we should not have um, illusions here. At the same time, even if Russia is losing the war, uh, it will have sufficient spoiler and disruptive cap capabilities to undermine uh, European security. Um, and um, and also in the in the neighborhood um, of of Europe, and I think we have to prepare for this. I think that can go long. It might it will not end this year. It can go two or three years. Um, it can uh, it it can be a longer period for which we have to prepare um, ourselves. And only, in my opinion, deep regime change in Russia um, will fundamentally change uh, the country. Even if the leadership is just superficially changing, it does not mean that this policy um, will, will will change. Um, so, and that's why I would still argue, I think uh, Europeans and Germans need to take more responsibility of their own security. Um, uh, and that will even maybe make it easier to coordinate it uh, with, with Washington in a way, and to, to raise also some support um, from, from Washington. And I think NATO will stay the key security actor in, in Europe. Um, but also European capabilities inside of NATO needs to be strengthened, and the EU needs needs to have also a, a stronger security component. Um, and I think that needs to be built up. And and we also have to understand that Russia will will not provide any more um, this this authoritarian stability in the post-Soviet space. Um, there will be new regional orders in in the in, in the different post-Soviet regions. If it's Central Asia, Black Sea region, South Caucasus, Eastern Europe. And the EU has to has to be a peace actor and is also a security actor in a much more comprehensive um, way in this region. So I think this decline of Russia, which will happen, which happens now with this war, will have huge implications for for the whole post-Soviet region. And I think that's our neighborhood, um, and we have to do to to do. So we have to be more an actor in this neighborhood, and we have to be also more a security actor there. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. This was actually a perfect um, transition to our um, next guest. Thank you very much, Catherine and Stefan, for your inputs, and please stay with us. Before we will bring in a perspective from Brussels, we would like to start another poll and ask our audience to vote on the following question. How do you assess the EU's response to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine? And there are three possible answers, positively, negatively, I do not know. So we are waiting for the results. And while we are waiting, I would like to already welcome and introduce Sergei Lagodinsky. Sergei Lagodinsky is member of the European Parliament for the Greens European Free Alliance and spokesperson on Russia. Um, I hope that I can see that he's already here with us. And hello, Sergey, a very warm welcome. And I would like to ask our colleagues in the background, okay, to publish the poll. So we can see that I can cannot see it anymore. That seventy two percent assess the EU's response positively. Um, could you, Giorgio, do you see the poll? I don't see the poll now. I'm very sorry. It disappeared. Ah, it's here there again. 16% negatively, and I do not know 
present. I think this is a good introduction of our debate. Sergey, again, a warm welcome. The question um, I would like um, to pose is, how do you ass assess the EU's response to Russia's war of aggression? And what are the demands? What are the recommendations of the Green Group with regard to EU strategies vis-a-vis -vis Russia, how to deal with Russia, and how to strengthen security in Central and Eastern Europe, how to make sure, um, to quote Stefan, that Europe will take more responsibility um, for its own security. Sergei, the floor is yours. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, pre I prepared uh, in, in, in German, but I will try to, to do it in English. So if it's, if it's a if bit not, want to... not as polished as you think, and, and then, then it's due to the uh, uh, translation. Okay, I'm, but I'm you could also whatever. switch to um, German if you want to. It's also possible. Yeah. Um, and you just have to choose another channel. Yeah, but the that, that's channel. okay. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try it in English. Um, well, thank you very much. And it's great to be here. Um, I would be a little bit less um, uh, enthusiastic than uh, Catherine uh, Stoner, who was here. And uh, I will explain why uh, I'm a little bit uh, of a different or more reserved uh, uh, opinion. Well, basically, for one major reason that I think we shouldn't underestimate. The question is, is our pushback vis-a-vis -vis Russia, is our support to Ukraine a transatlantic project or a global project? And I think that any praise and any self-congratulation that we can pronounce, and I would join the positive assessment of European Union and American cooperation on that and the G7 cooperation on that actually um, supports the idea that this is a transatlantic project. It should be and should have been, from my perspective, uh, a global project, but we failed to make it to a global project. Because uh, if we look at uh, the support uh, from BRIC states to uh, a number of states in the global south, we will see that uh, we cannot uh, deliver on one thing. And this thing is an integral part of our strategy that we had chosen at the beginning of this year. The strategy was, um, you know, to put it short, uh, combined of two points. Ukrainians fight on the field with our support, and we are doing our best to isolate Russia, Russian Federation, uh, economically, in terms of its society, and in terms of uh, uh, technology. And I think this is something that uh, we failed uh, to deliver. Russia has been squeezed, but it was not isolated. And the um, outcome and the effect of it is that instead of isolation, we're having an effect of regrouping of the world order. And this, I think, we should keep in mind uh, regarding our strategy and what it means for ourselves. Um, so this, I think, is an important point to keep in mind when we talk about um, our uh, uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia or our strategy in this war to begin with. I think that uh, in order to talk about this, I, I just want to make you know, three larger points. Number one, and this is something that I think from the German perspective is important, is the, the point uh, of where do we stand with our ability to act strategically, both in Germany and in the EU. Uh, I think that the, the, the well um, appraised and established policy of value-oriented foreign policy that uh, also our foreign uh, um, uh, minister brought with it, that we also fought for it, is being misunderstood very often as a purely value-based foreign policy. In fact, what I, how I see it, it's a necessary corrective and correction of the very egocentric German foreign policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia, especially in the Eastern, in Eastern Europe. So this correction has been done uh, also by this current government. 
The next step and the next challenge is to add to this ability to think and to act geostrategically. I think that kind of the end goal should be a value-driven geopolitics. And this is something that both Germany and European Union still have to learn. And we are in the process of learning, but I'm not sure that we can learn as fast as the world is changing. This is kind of a, on a more conceptual uh, uh, plane. Uh, on a more strategic plane, what, we, what I see and what I experience now in Europe is a little bit of a confusion regarding various projects to address the aggression, the Russian aggression in Ukraine. We have, however, to uh, um, prioritize them. And I think number one is something that I called uh, um, realpolitische Notwendigkeit, so the basket where we need to deliver, so things that we need to have. This is, from my perspective, the military capabilities, the military necessity for Ukraine uh, in order to have an effective uh, uh, progress on the field. Number two is normative zwangsläufigkeit. So we, that things that we are bound to have normatively. That I think is a, a matter of uh, issues of impunity, uh, of issues of the future dissuasion uh, for those who cross the red line, the normative red lines of international order. And then we have a basket, which I think is important and good, but I think is a little bit distractive. It's kind of the things that are nice to have. And we need to start you know, a discussion about things, whether uh, you know, we can invest our political focus in everything we would like to do now instead of everything that we must do now. I uh, am a big proponent of the issue of confiscation uh, of oligarchs' assets. I'm uh, uh, very curious and I support uh, Ukrainian claims also regarding uh, uh, issues of state re reserves. However, this is not, these are not the questions that will deliver the victory to Ukrainians. And we have to um, realize that. Uh, as opposed to, for example, criminal impunity, etc., so that the incentives are set right. I think that ordering things and, and classifying and prioritizing things within the European Union is something that have been missing. We need to focus, from my perspective, on military issues and on isolation issues that can demobilize Russians instead of just, you know, punitively... Uh, 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 punish everyone. Um, number three and the third point, uh, I think, is a long-term view. And this view that I mentioned is, um, from my perspective, sometimes not um, seen uh, uh, in the context. And the two contexts that I already mentioned and that I would like to emphasize are the context in time and the context in ge geography. Um, what does this war and what did this war meant from a historical perspective? I think that this is a cesur, as they say in German. This is the point which will be comparable uh, to the Holocaust uh, experiences and lessons and to the World War II lessons, uh, at least for the Central and uh, Eastern European members of the European Union. I think for the European Union, this will be a starting point for a whole new self-understanding, a more geopolitical uh, uh, self-understanding of European Union. And on that, we can discuss the issues of expansion, uh, et cetera. Uh, but in terms of geography, I think we're still, we were not able to isolate uh, Russia. And this regrouping that I meant will mean that we will be heading to a new world order, which will be sorted, out, uh, sorted in a different way where we will not be able to dominate, where we will be either in, in a bipolar or whatever uh, uh, order this will be. And for that, the EU has to prepare for this. We are not prepared yet. This means that what we are proud of, uh, very proud of now, our kind of the normative power or whatever soft power, you name it, is not enough uh, for us to uh, have a clear 
geostrategic and project a geostrategic global power that we would need to be able to compete in this new world order. We need to invest into economic, military, uh, and global outreach. We need to talk to global south, not only in terms of normative appeals and calls, but also in terms of offers. What can we offer uh, uh, to the global south, which will not just be normative? Uh, and in terms of leverages, what are the levers that we have uh, in order to work with uh, third countries? What is the so-called development and policy for us, except uh, for a humanitarian calling that we, we have? We will have to rethink uh, these people. I will stop here, yes. uh, but I'm happy to discuss uh, what the implications are um, in the future in the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Sergey, for adding the global um, dimension to the transatlantic one. I would have one question, um, and this question um, refers to the resolution adopted mid-January this year. Um, the European Parliament calls for the establishment of a tribunal on the crime of aggression against Ukraine, stressing that an international legal action would send a clear signal to Russia and the world. Um, could you please tell us a little bit more about the resolution and possible next steps, but please be brief because we have two excellent other speakers. Well, the resolution is, is, is available and everyone can read it. Uh, on that, we are transparent. <laughs> Our resolutions can be read online. Um, I pushed for this resolution because also, also as an international lawyer, for me, it is important uh, to show that uh, even in the new world order that we will we are heading to, uh, there are red lines and there are norm, normative uh, mm, civilizational norms that we want to keep and we want to enforce. And those, even if they are presidents or, by, or, or heads of governments, which is the case in the crime of aggression, uh, it is about their responsibility. We need to start a process. We don't know how this, how long this process will, will, will go. But start a process of identifying and constructing a mechanism that at some point when uh, the immunities uh, of uh, Putin, of Lavrov and others are not there anymore, uh, we will be able to bring them to justice, not uh, because, not only because there were war crimes like in Bucha, but also because kind of the, the core crime of what happened was the aggression against a neighboring state. And this is uh, our lesson from the Nuremberg uh, uh, tribunals. And this is something that we need to have in a special tribunal, which we cannot establish through the Security Council because of Russia, Russian role there. And we need new ways and new models and new designs to do this. Thank you very much, Sergei. Please allow me to invite our last two speakers um, to our online panel. Angela Stent is director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies and professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University. A very warm welcome to you, Angela. And Hennady Maksak is executive director of the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian PRISM, a leading foreign policy think tank in Ukraine. Well, it is, of course, impossible to predict how and when Russia's war of aggression will end. Nevertheless, we would like to continue looking ahead, envisioning future support and relations with Ukraine and strategies vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And Angela, I would like um, to pose my uh, next question to you. In your foreign affairs article, The World Putin Wants, you published together with Fiona Hill, you describe how Putin's distortions about the past feed delusions about the future. You stress that Vladimir Putin is determined to shape the future to look like his version of the past, and that he believes it is Russia's divine right to rule Ukraine. What does this mean for future US strategies and policy towards Russia? How might they look like in the future? and what scenarios are conceivable from your perspective? Well, thank you for the question and <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to this very interesting um, symposium. So if we talk about future US policies, clearly it's going to depend on how the war ends and none of us can say now how, this is, how it's going to end. But if we assume that after it ends, 
um, Putin or some or people with Putin's imperial mindset are still in power in the Kremlin. Uh, I think the main lesson we've learned from this war, and Catherine already alluded to it, is deterrence failed. Uh, we did everything we could to try and deter this. We sat down with the Russians when they presented these draft treaties in December of 2021. The US, NATO were willing to make concessions all to no avail. They weren't serious about that. So the question is going forward, how could we make deterrence more effective? How can we prevent Russia from doing this again? And we know that the Russians have set their sights. If you look at what they said in the draft treaties, not only on Ukraine, Moldova was already mentioned, but essentially on all of the Warsaw Pact, former Warsaw Pact states that they believe should be in their sphere of influence. Um, and so I think that's you know a main, main, major challenge going forward. And that is to say, we need much more creative and effective ways of looking at deterrence. Um, uh, and Stefan has already said, Obviously, NATO has emerged from this war as the only organization that can really guarantee security for its, its members in Europe. So we will be looking at a European security system going forward. Again, as long as people like Putin are in power, that excludes Russia. How can you have security in Europe without Russia? Um, and we've tried you know, over the past 30 years to include Russia in this, and obviously it didn't work. So I think this is will be a major uh, challenge going forward. Um, I was asked, you know, is this a new Cold War? In this scenario, this is a new Cold War on steroids, uh, because we really need to be more effective um, in our ability to deter Russia from doing this again, from invading one of its neighbors. Uh, and by the way, I agree completely with Catherine on the RAND study. I think anyone who advocates now sitting down with Russia and negotiating and having a ceasefire has forgotten the fact that Russia has violated every agreement it signed with Ukraine in the last 30 years that had to do with Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Now, a second scenario and a more hopeful one is if you did have a group of people coming to power in the Kremlin in the future who reassessed Russia's antagonistic view of the West and reassessed uh, the imperial mindset that we see prevalent in the Russian elite, then you could have a different policy. Um, I think one thing that worries me greatly is that the Russians have no interest now in even sitting down with the United States and discussing strategic stability uh, and the implementation of the New START agreement and what happens after that. So that would be a major challenge uh, immediately if you had a different people group of people in power to reestablish the norms of arms control and really uh, provide that there won't be more proliferation going forward because the implications of not having an agreement with Russia are that we will we will have more nuclear proliferation. Um, so you could have a, a, a different set of rulers in Russia, but it depends on who's on, in power in the Kremlin, and that would also shape U.S. strategy. And the third thing I have to mention, and Catherine already has, is, of course, it depends on who's in power in the United States, too. Uh, and if we do have a, you know, we have a presidential election coming up in 2024, and if Donald Trump or someone with similar views were elected, then you would have a reassessment, or you could have a reassessment of U.S. engagement in Europe of US policy toward Russia, uh, you kind of have a much more isolationist policy. And that would mean that you wouldn't have this what I think has been very impressive US-European coordination um, in terms of dealing with both Ukraine and Russia. And then, of course, all bets are off because then we're in a, in a very different situation. Um, and I think the final thing I will say, and it goes back to Sergei's point, um, as we've seen, the global South has been unwilling to condemn Russia, to sanction Russia, or to support Ukraine. And I think the other challenge for the collective West, and that's the North America, it's Europe, it's Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, all of those countries um, going forward um, is, is going to be dealing with this new world order where you will probably have a large group of countries larger in population than the collective West, although poorer in aggregate. Um, who want to remain neutral, who do not uh, view Russia necessarily as an antagonistic power, and who, who view the conflict in Ukraine as a sort of European conflict that doesn't really affect them, and who are largely anti-American and think that America is hypocritical in terms of criticizing Russia. So I think that's the global challenge going forward. 
Thank you so much, um, Angela. And um, Hanadi, please um, come in now. What should be the priorities for dealing with Russia in the future from, an, from a Ukrainian perspective? The floor is yours, Hanadi. Thank you so much for having me here. I think it's a great privilege to talk in such a famous audience with great expertise on Russian issues. When it comes to Ukraine point of view on uh, future relations or future strategy on Russia, I think it is clearly defined in the 10 points, uh, 10 points uh, policy of Zelensky, which is like uh, which is a uh, peace formula. And I would say for Ukraine, it's very important to see all uh, the uh, aspects we have now in wartime uh, diplomacy, as we say in Ukraine, when it comes to our relations with, with the West. Uh, the first, um, the first uh, point is that we have to be aware of the uh, deterrence effect of the sanctions. And it was clearly said by uh, our uh, colleagues that uh, sanctions do their job. It is a good news for you, for Ukraine as well. Second point is military assistance. I think this is something which is important to deal with Russia and to understand that more we have possibilities and potential to uh, squeeze out Russian troops from Ukraine. Uh, uh, the more important for Russia is to keep the policy uh, have to uh, exit from Ukraine with, with uh, political instruments. I think it's uh, something we have to bear in mind all the time. But uh, when it also comes to our um, uh, Russian strategy, I would say it is also responsibility for crimes. I think you also mentioned this with uh, tribunal resolution of European Parliament. We are grateful for this uh, endeavor from the side of our um, uh, partners in the European Parliament, I think uh, we also have some, some support from some EU member states. But I think this trend should be extended because it's very important. This is something uh, that Russia hasn't experienced for uh, Soviet crimes and something which just loosens their approach to, to Ukraine and to their uh, aggression in, in, in Ukrainian territories. Another point which is very important and it's part of Ukrainian strategy uh, with Russia is reparations for the damage they caused in Ukraine. I think it's very important to understand that each crime should be, uh, Russia should be counted for each crime on this territory and all the damage should be also assessed and paid a fair for, fair, fairly from, from the money of, of Russia, be it a set freeze, be it kind of reparations, it is very important for Ukraine to uh, share this point of view with our Western partners. And basically, this also leads to another point, which is uh, uh, exit strategy for Russia, how to pressure, how to make them uh, feel uh, poten potentially eager to uh, exit from, from this uh, situation, because at this moment, uh, from the information we have in Ukraine and from our partners, uh, Putin is not going to, to, to stop this war and he's still trying to uh, save the territory he occupies, he occupied. And in this, in this way, I think it is very important to uh, uh, also press him for the exit strategy, which is, uh, which is in line with our common uh, outlines, as we see in European Union, in NATO partners, and in Ukraine. Uh, well, when it comes to uh, our strategy towards Russia, this is maybe fairly all, but I would say that uh, also long-term security architecture is core for Ukraine, and basically how to come to the idea of membership in, in, this, in this track is something uh, we, have to, uh, we have to align our policy with, with our partners in NATO and European Union. Thank you so much, Sergei. I would like to give you the floor um, to, to react um, on Angela's and Hanadi's um, inputs. Um, I think it would be extremely also interesting to um, hear what you have to say on the exit, exit strategy for Russia and um, the long-term security perspective for um, Ukraine and, of course, the entire region. On the long-term security to, for Ukraine, I mean, first of all, thank you very much, uh, both Hennady and Angela. It's great to see you, and especially to you, Hennady, um, our solidarity, um, knowing that you're speaking to us from Kiev, as far as I uh, can uh, judge um, the um, uh, uh, on the um, issue um, of uh, 
um, uh, long-term securities. I am. Um, I know that we're still in the process of discussing this, and I know that there are different um, um, opinions uh, among also the green colleagues. However, I think that the key of compact, uh, which uh, uh, is something that the uh, government of Ukraine uh, is supporting, uh, we just had the presentation of it uh, uh, by Mr. Yermak and uh, by Mr. Rasmussen uh, in our uh, committee, um, Foreign Affairs Committee and Defense Committee. And um, I think that this is the right way to go because this uh, is a way of um, giving the positive security guarantees and not just the negative security guarantees to Ukraine, investing into Ukrainian ability to defend itself uh, and also talking about um, about options without uh, focusing and only channeling the NATO membership, which you know we can discuss. And I'm uh, actually open on 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 this issue. But before we have come to a full fledged NATO membership, we already have to start building uh, uh, the, the security guarantees in whatever sense is meant there. And I think this uh, interesting, this is an interesting roadmap, which we discussed with Rasmussen and Mr. Yermak in the parliament. I wanted to react to one more point that Angela said. What, what did we learn and what are we learning from this, what we're experiencing? And one thing, as Angela mentioned, is that deterrence failed. I think there are a couple of more lessons that I think are interesting. Uh, actually, the new dynamics shows that the mutual nuclear dissuasion um, does not work anymore for Russia uh, if it is about kind of expansionary threat. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, I, I wonder what the Russians are, are learning from this, that we do not take their nuclear threats seriously anymore. And that actually by whatever, China uh, or other members, they are not able to play the card of nuclear threat uh, if it is about pushing them back away from Ukrainian territories. We are not afraid. Some people are, and that's why they're doing it in the informational uh, space, but generally the countries are not, which, uh, which shows that a nuclear uh, country cannot do anything that they want in their neighborhood um, without being pushed back. Uh, the one thing that I think is still valid is that the nuclear threat as a defensive mechanism, as long as it is, as, as, as soon as it goes to the border of Russia, is still working. And we see it as, as we, you know, are ready to give weapons, but not being used on the Russian territory recognized by international law, of course. I would not go uh, so far to say, well, the Crimea has been, has been proclaimed by Russians, you know, whatever they proclaim their territory, uh, we should not touch it. I don't think that this is uh, our position on the international community. One, and two other uh, lessons, I think, which are important. Conventional forces work and can uh, do the, and, and can provide escalation dominance that Stefan made, made it. Uh, talked. Even the old conventional forces can actually inflict a lot of damage that we saw if it is done by a large a country. However, they are not enough to win the war if they are used in a 20th century kind of type of war way. We are actually seeing that it's not just about numbers. It's about strategy. It's about logistics. It's about technology that can empower even a weaker, a seemingly weaker uh, uh, partner in the war to push back a huge giant that thinks that he can just do it, a trumpet by numbers. And I think these are the lessons that are interesting to see how all the actors will learn from them in the future. Thank you so much. Angela, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Yes, just an addendum um, to what Sergei said. I mean, I agree with you partly about the utility of the nuclear threat, but I would also say, you know, I could uh, criticize the U.S. government and really the entire transatlantic community that we have limited what we are doing for Ukraine. And in the U.S. case, you know, we didn't have a no-fly zone. We haven't provided the Ukrainians yet with weapons that can really hit far into Russia, precisely uh, because we because the U.S 
believes that it doesn't want to get into a direct, you know, where the Russians could claim this is a direct conflict. So that nuclear threat is limiting, it's restricting what the US government's doing. So, and of course, the Russians realize that. Thank you so much. Hennady, please go ahead um, to also comment from your perspective. And there is one question from the audience I would like um, to mention here. Considering the constraints of resources and the time span, the war might still go on. When is the right time? Sorry, when is the right time for reconstruction of infrastructure and buildings of Ukraine, considering that the full scale war still continues with huge loss in infrastructure? Thank you. I'll start with, with the question. I, I would say that uh, this is clearly important to understand that uh, there should be two tracks. One is fast track when it comes to uh, reconstruction, when we have uh, social and critical infrastructure in Ukraine, which is hit by Russian uh, missiles and drones. And it's very important to uh, try to uh, do our utmost possible, utmost in our potential, to rebuild it in, in um, just shorter terms, because it influences the lives of Ukrainians, uh, uh, which are now in, in Ukraine, which are still in Ukraine. But when it comes to large extent uh, reconstruction, I think it's also a time uh, consuming process, and we have to start the process of coordination at the same same time, we also have to start the process of pooling these resources. And I would say this is a great uh, um, honor for Ukraine that uh, European Commission uh, volunteered to be part of the uh, coordination body when it comes to the platform for construction of uh, or rebuilding of Ukraine. I think this is a good endeavor, and it, it also could be uh, quite important for us to understand how to secure these investments that go to Ukraine while the war is still uh, ongoing and we still have these casualties in Ukraine. Uh, two comments I would like to um, uh, pick up to the, to, to the uh, phrase coined by Angela uh, about uh, Cold War on steroids. I think it's very important uh, to understand the, that this process is also uh, uh, is dynamic, but at the same time in our, uh, in our assessments, we uh, see that it is uh, quite directly dependent on the level of uh, military support and financial support from our partners. The more we have at this moment, the more potent is our uh, armed forces to uh, just deal on the battlefield. And basically, I think it is something we have to bear in mind because at the moment, we, we are all talking about uh, offensive, which is uh, which is planned for, 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 for the spring time. But at the same time, I would say that also, we measure uh, our success in cooperation with uh, our partners in coalitions. We had coalition on, on uh, Hovitzers, we had coalition on HIMARS, we had coalitions on uh, anti-aircraft uh, systems, now we have coalition on battle tanks. Uh, maybe the next one is on, on fighter jets, but I think that the pace is incremental and so slow that this doesn't uh, it is not enough for us to 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 be prepared fully for for this offensive and to uh, to just to deal militarily uh, effectively in time that we uh, see as a horizon for us. We we expected to have it in 2023, but I mm -hmm. think that it's really going to be a prolonged story. And basically, we we don't want to have this Cold War uh, with extended period horizon because it is taking place on Ukrainian territory. Good news mm -hmm. is that yet uh, European uh, perspective on security is aligned with uh, partners, uh, and NATO is the main provider of security. And that's why I would like to react to uh, what Sergei says about interim assurances in security architecture before we join NATO. I think this is something very important for us in Ukraine, and uh, we don't see the uh, the clear answer at this moment. We have mm -hmm. to discuss the situation, and we have to, to propose some tangible, clear guarantees for Ukraine. Thank you very much, Nadi. Um, Sergei, there is one question uh, from a participant I would like to pose um, to you. Much of the debate so far has focused on Putin's style autocracy as an external Russian threat to Western democracy that can be fought with increased weapons, weapon spending. Could you further expand on transnational anti-democratic networks and which strategies do you suggest to combat this internal anti-democratic threat? 
Uh, well, I think it's Nadine uh, um, uh, who who posed this question. Greetings from Brussels. Um, I, we can we can talk about this for ages. This opens a whole new <laughs> dimension. Uh, I think what what is important there is that in uh, many of the assumptions that we were meeting now and we were taking now are assumptions that our alliance will work for at least two, three upcoming years. Uh, and I would like to introduce this uncertainty, uh, which w is precisely because some internal actors who are encouraged by this international global actors, including the Putin machinery, could disrupt our plans. Um, and this is, of course, um, the issue of U.S. Uh, uh, elections. But this is, of course, an issue of any elections. I mean, even uh, we are lucky that we don't have elections in Eastern uh, German Bundesländer this year. But in most of them, uh, in the lead, we have Alternative for Germany, which is a pro-Putin uh, uh, revisionist uh, party. Uh, and the same you know, we will have um, an, on, on many other, on many, in many other countries. What we have to do, we have to understand that this is part of our geostrategic fight for uh, democracy and freedom. Um, we can only do this if we, and these are two, uh, at least two, two points. Number one, we have to be credible. And this is another question that was asked there on, America, uh, on uh, international criminal court. We cannot win the uh, uh, international legitimacy if we say that certain rules do not apply to us but then they apply to others and then they apply to us again and and, and so on and so forth we need some we need to get some things straight and uh, this is i think something that we have done uh, there's a mis mistakes that we have to also uh, accept if we want a special tribunal we need to do hom our homework on international criminal court and this also means our American friends, our you know Israeli friends, whatever, we will need to agree that certain rules apply to everyone. Um, and this is the, the, what we have to do. And the second is that we need to be able to be resilient, resilient within ourselves in order to be able to regenerate the democratic and anti-authoritarian uh, uh, mechanism again and again and again, even under pressure. And this uh, should be part of our geostrategic agenda. Thank you so much, Sergei. Um, well, time is running, and I would like to invite all speakers now for a last statement. Um, but you only have half a minute, because otherwise we are going to be late. Um, there's one question um, you can pick, but you don't have to. Um, but we would actually like to ask you, is there reason to be hopeful? And why? But you can also, of course, decide to comment uh, on another um, aspect of the discussion. I would like to give the floor first to Maya. Please keep the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, yeah, I'm very happy, first of all, to hear that I think that all of the experts uh, are um, conscious and uh, and uh, ready to say that we need more cooperation, strategic cooperation on a field of, uh, uh, of Russian invasion to Ukraine and also on the change of the um, strategic uh, way of how the global world is looking. It is a change and we need to, as the Western world, uh, take a stand and take a place because things are happening behind our uh, backs and uh, I think that the most important uh, thing right now is to bring a proper strategic communication and also strategi strategize and put the priorities uh, for the future uh, because that's um, that's crucial and it's great that the experts are saying about it I think it's a time to put more pressure to the governments and decision makers um, to go also in this direction. Thank you so much, and also for keeping the time. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, really interesting discussion. I suppose just in response to um, to Mr. Lagodinsky. Um, so I, I agree with what you're saying about the global south, and, and in three minutes, one can't say everything. But yes, it's a huge concern, of course, and this is not new uh, um, with in terms of, of Russia sort of seeding over the last uh, 10, 10 to 12 years, um, uh, positive um, sentiments from uh, the global south. 
Um, I wrote a book actually uh, that came out almost exactly two years ago on Russia's power and purpose in a new global order. And that's part of the new global order Mr. Putin sees. So I agree with that. And that's that's something we have to work with our, our, our Southern partners on is is having them understand well actually wheat prices right the reason that they're going up in places like egypt and elsewhere uh is is because of this conflict so it's not just a european conflict in terms of being hopeful i'll just say we're here we are working together um that was not a foregone conclusion that we would be moving in lockstep and i think so far that that has helped protect uh, and save ukrainian sovereignty um so let's hope that that continues in the future thank you so much catherine stefan yeah, I think it has been a really interesting discussion. It would be great to be in, uh, in, in also in one room and to to really have a, have more interaction. Um, so it, I'm I'm not so pessimistic to be honest. I think what we now see is the end of the Russian Empire. I think it's an acceleration of Russia as an empire, as a colonial colonial power, and Russia by itself with this war um, is accelerating this this process. And I think this is an opportunity for change in the entire post-Soviet region. And the question is who will in the future shape um, uh, uh, South Caucasus, Black Sea region, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and if the EU uh, is willing to be here more an actor, that's a big question mark also to, to, to Brussels, but especially also to the members states and how the countries um, uh, by themselves uh, will, will use this opportunity. And I think we can see here also some, some positive developments, I would say. Um, and, and so it's not just a negative uh, development. And I don't, I don't take this autocracies very, very, very democracy um, pattern, I think, which is also very much discussed. I think the world is much more diverse. And we see also that there are, there are many countries in the global south, which are neither support one or the other side. Um, yeah, so and I think this is about also to us to engage more with other parts of, of the world, uh, with a different approach, um, with a less also colonialistic and arrogant approach, which we often have, yeah, that we tell them how to do things. And I think we have to relearn this, and we will have more trans actional relations um, we will have less multilateralism so i think it will be will be also much more challenging for europe and the so-called west yeah so but i think that's that's also the opening for for the european countries to uh, to to more integrate and to be more player here um, and i think again this is this attempt yeah what russia is doing now is also an opportunity uh, in 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 this direction thank you so much stefan Hennady. Uh, thank you. I would like maybe to pick up to what Stefan said previously, that uh, now Europe operates in crisis mode. I think this is something we also admit in Ukraine. And long-term perspective and long-term strategizing is something we need at the moment, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, I would say. Mm -hmm. How to deal with Russia, how to make this process on motion, I mean, the colonization of this country, how to make this process of uh, new deterrence, how to build this architecture. I think these discussions should be more frequent uh, in Washington, in Brussels, in European, in European uh, uh, capitals. And I think it's also be the paid way for us have to understand how to deal with, with Russia. And either it's not for Ukraine to win this war or not to lose. I think the answer is the first one. Thank you so much. Angela, please go ahead. Yeah, if, if you had asked me a year ago um, whether I could envisage Ukraine fighting back so effectively and such a coordinated and successful transatlantic coalition uh, to support Ukraine and against Russia, I, I probably wouldn't have thought that was possible. So I think the good news is obviously the most important thing that Ukraine is really fighting for its own war of independence. Finally, I agree with Stefan that this is the beginning of the end of the Russian Empire, even if Mr. Putin and the people around him don't accept that. Um, and the fact that up to a million Russians have left Russia uh, since the war began also shows that there is a sizable number of people who do want something different for Russia. That I think is more, more longer term, but I do think the good news is what we've achieved so far and hopefully we'll be able to achieve in the future. Thank you so much, Angela. Sergei. You will not believe it. I'll try to make it brief. Um, number one, for me, the only hope and the only measure to measure hope is Ukraine to be victorious. And addressing what Eva wrote in, in the chat, I think, and that is something that takes hope away from me, 
we are doing things, the right things too late. Um, uh, everything that is being delivered or will be delivered within the next four months, it's too late. Ukrainians need it now, and we're not prepared to deliver it now. And uh, sorry to say this, I re keep repeating, it. even before the war, I advocated delivering weapons. This was the time when we should have started. And if I blame Scholz, then, then that we are late on this. But uh, to put it in, in, in three uh, uh, points, yes, hopeful, we, we should be hopeful, but we should be strategic, hopeful, but not naive, and hopeful, but not self-congratulatory. If we keep these conditions, then we can be hopeful. Thank you so much, Sergei, and thank you, I mean, um, for all your excellent inputs, for your efforts. I would also like to thank the people in the background, the interpreters, the technicians, and of course, my, my great colleagues. And with that, I would like to pass the floor to Giorgio. Thank you so much again, everyone. Und ich werde in Deutsch zwei Abschiedsworte sagen. And I will be speaking in German, just to final concluding remarks. As always, uh, we will host a short uh, survey in the chat. And for those who stick online, I would like to ask you to feedback uh, what they liked and disliked about the session of today. Second information. And this uh, debate is not finished. We will presume it tomorrow. And we will take up an issue that has been mentioned several times today about the question of the global south. What is the stance of the global south when it comes to the war in Ukraine? We've seen um, that there is some irritation, and I really look forward to, to the UN ambassador of Kenya. Then the State Minister Katya Cole will be with us, experts from Indian, South Africa and Argentina will be with us. Uh, the former Argentinian ambassador in Ukraine will be with us. So it's really worthwhile to join for this third session of our foreign policy conference. And that's about it uh, from me, from us and uh, today, as well as yesterday, we'd like to thank you all for all those who have uh, made it possible in the Fundrecht for facilitation. Then, of course, uh, thanks to all my colleagues, Melia from Grunewald, uh, from the Division of Foreign and Security, and then Kerner Fischer from the Diplomacy Lab, Katrin Bertram, and uh, our Ukrainian intern, Daria Yermechuk. So, if you wish, you can switch your cameras on so we can see your pretty faces. and. If this is not the case, then I simply bid you farewell, wave you and say until tomorrow.